Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. Um, in this video we're going to be talking about acids and bases through history. So looking at how our ideas and understanding about um, what is an acid um, has changed over time from much more historical definitions through to more, much more modern day explanations. Okay, so we're going to try and keep this really short and sweet, um, introduce you to some of the key theorists and a little bit of information about their ideas, um, as well as then showing you how the ideas have developed. Okay, so there's four main theorists that we need to be familiar with here, and I'll just give you a quick snapshot first. Okay, so the first one that we need to be familiar with was a man named Lavoisier. Okay, and his definition in 1776. We then come to a man, Humphrey, D Humphrey Davy, in 1810. We get to a, a Swedish chemist, Svante Arrhenius, in 1899. And then two chemists, uh, Lowry, who was British, and Bronsted, who was Danish, who uh, simultaneously but separately um, proposed the, the most modern uh, um, kind of theory that we're going to focus on. Okay, um, so they're, they're the four kind of um, the four kind of guys that we're going to look at. Okay, so Antoine Lavoisier, you know, one of the most famous um, chemists in history, you know, kind of the, the father of modern chemistry. Um, so, you know, French aristocrat, you know, was able to spend most of his time conducting chemical experiments because he didn't have to work for a living otherwise. And um, up until the point at which he got his head chopped off in the French Revolution was incredibly, um, was an in incredible intellect. Okay, but so his, he originally um, proposed that um, an acid was any compound, a non-metal compound with oxygen. Okay, so a non a non-metal um, compound with oxygen. Um, so you know, so um, so his definition um, helped us. Uh, you know, would help with things like uh, nitric and sulfuric acids, where we've got a compound between nitrogen or sulfur and oxygen that then, when they're combined with water, uh, makes something that's, that's acidic. The only problem is that then you get to an example like hydrochloric acid, and the whole thing falls apart. Okay, because hydrochloric acid is, there's no question that it's acidic, but it does not contain oxygen, so it doesn't work. We get to then Humphrey Davy, early 1800s, after the, the you know, massive kind of technological explosion of, of, um, of ideas and, and new elements being discovered through the use of electricity, being able to um, separate um, compounds into their elements um, using, by the application of electrical energy, so sodium, potassium, heaps of, of elements like that. So he proposed that it was uh, any compound that contained hydrogen. Okay, you could see that um, hydrogen compounds that contain hydrogen tended to exhibit the, the behaviour of acids, um, and so that you know that helped with with some of our examples like nitric and sulfuric and hydrochloric acids. Um, but then it also meant that we had to include things like water and ammonia and methane. They all contain hydrogen, uh, but they don't really behave as acids as far as they would have known back then. You know, ammonia we recognise as being something that's basic, um, and methane is a gas that doesn't do anything. So it, it's too broad a definition. So um, so in that sense that it does that doesn't fit either. But he was approaching, uh, you know, um, uh, getting much closer to the, the definitions that we work with these days. Okay, so then we get to Arrhenius. Okay, so that he proposed um, that an acid is a substance that produces hydrogen ions, H plus ions, in water. Okay, so that works for all of our much more common, you know, the acids that we're much more familiar with, and it also helps to exclude um, the um, water, ammonia, and methane. These these examples that we've um, we've talked about here, um, because they don't do this. Now, so thinking and giving a bit of historical context, Arrhenius was proposing these ideas around about the time that Thomson was was um, confirming the existence of the electron, that there were particles smaller than atoms that existed inside the atom that were charged. Um, and up until then, they had discovered that, the, that there were some compounds that were made up of particles that were charged, um, that then were, were called ions. And so then he um, had so he determined that there were these... Um, these hydrogen ions that existed, and that substances that were acidic um, were the ones that tended to uh, contain them. 
Um, now, one of the key key thing, features of this theory is that it must be um, in water. So we're talking aqueous ions so that they're separate from each other, that we can get compounds that break apart in water. Um, and that's also one of the drawbacks of this um, as, as time went on, that they recognised that, that that's a, a, a condition that hampers things a bit. Okay, um, but also, but before we move on, um, he also then um, proposed that something that was basic produced hydroxide ions in water. Okay, or caused the production of hydroxide ions in water. Um, now, that didn't necessarily mean that it had to be a hydroxide compound, but he recognised that when you put some compounds into, into water, they produce hydroxide, and that made it the solution basic. But especially being able to actually do this, especially if it wasn't a hydroxide compound, there was no real explanation. And also the main kind of drawback, as I talked about before, is that it was limited only to reactions that happened in water. But um, as time went on, they recognised that there were some reactions that were acid-base reactions that were occurring where there was no water present. Um, you know, so one kind of classic sort of example is where we could take ammonia gas and hydrogen chloride gas, which is what becomes hydrochloric acid when we put it in water, and could get a solid deposit of ammonium chloride on the inside of the tube. If you, if you pump the gases in from, from, from both ends of the tube, then you've got this, this deposit forming. But they're, both, there's two, they're two gases. This is not dissolved in water. But clearly there's a chemical change happening that relates to you know, an acid and a base forming a salt. Okay, and so there was no, was no explanation for, for why that could work. Until then, Lowry and Bronsted, separately but concurrently, that is at the same time, um, developed this idea that acids are, um, they are proton, that is H plus donors. Okay, um, this idea that... Um, that, and so, so thinking, let's let, we'll give a sec of historical context. Remember that between, so Arrhenius was around about the time of the electron, but between um, him and 1923, we've got, you know, Rutherford, we have Bohr, we have quantum mechanics, we've got the discovery of the nucleus, the discovery of the proton, you know, pro proposing electron shells and orbits and all of these sorts of ideas which were as yet unknown when Arrhenius was proposing his ideas. And so what they recognised was that um, because of the structure of, of the atom, that hydrogen atom, you know, so where it's just got a little proton in the middle and one little electron orbiting around the outside, okay, that this is our hydrogen, that then if you, if you turn it into an ion, and that is by taking that electron away, that all you're left with is a proton at the centre. That is the nub of its nucleus, is a proton. So actually when we're considering hydrogen ions being formed, we're actually um, causing a proton to become separate. And so what he then proposed is saying, all right, well, if uh, an acid is any substance that can donate a proton to something else, which means that then um, that by comparison that bases are proton acceptors. So an acid-base reaction is actually um, what we would call a proton transfer reaction. That is one proton moving from one substance to, the, to another substance and forming a new thing. Um, forming ions that then come together to make a salt. And this doesn't need water because it's not dependent on them being separate ions to start with, just so long as they can donate a proton and something else can accept it. Now, what we recognise now is that these first two definitions from Lavoisier and Davy, um, we don't, you know, we, we think about them historically. We don't pay them much attention anymore. But Arrhenius' theory and the Lowry-Bronsted theory, or sometimes called Bronsted-Lowry theory, both have some use for us, even here and now. That, um, just like with models of the atom, that sometimes the previous model helps to explain some things we can observe better than the more current one. And so we don't discard it altogether. We take it with a grain of salt, um, no pun intended, knowing that it, there are some things that it explains and some things that it don't, doesn't. We, we recognise the limitations, um, but then we use them where it helps. All right, so we've talked about Lavoisier, we've talked about Davy, Arrhenius, and uh, Lowry and Bronsted, and seeing how their ideas of acids and bases have improved over time. All right, thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.